Welcome to our uh, webinar today, Minimizing the Risk of Innovation Failure Through Great Questions. And uh, we have a great set of panelists with us to explore this question, this challenge that uh, I suspect that many of us on the, the line today share and, and want to delve into. So uh, with that, uh, uh, next slide, please. So by way of uh, preliminaries, uh, for those who uh, perhaps are, are not as familiar with SPIGIT as, as perhaps others are on the, uh, on the line, uh, SPIGIT is recognized as the leader in innovation management uh, per the likes of uh, analyst firms such as Forrester and Gartner. Uh, we do have the largest market share and, uh, and the greatest revenue base. And as you'll find through the discussion that we have with, with our panelists, who also represent to get clients, uh, we have a, a wonderful set of clientele as, as well. Uh, next slide, please. Specifically, uh, when we say that we're number one um, in terms of um, you know market market share, market size, uh, we're number one in innovation software for for the enterprise in, in particular. So that means number one market share in innovation management. We have over 5 million users uh, in about 150 or so countries. Uh, they, they are representing um, over a billion plus in growth, uh, top line. And interestingly, uh, from this work, one of the outcomes of the practice of collaborative innovation, of course, is novel, ultimately patentable innovation. And, and as we understand from talking with our clients, had over 200 plus patents driven by by customers, and uh, you know some folks have referred to us in the past as the Apple, the Apple of innovation software. That from a Spigot customer. Uh, next slide, please. So for today, we have uh, three panelists, uh, and I'll, I'll just quickly run through this, and then we'll do a little bit deeper introductions uh, as we get into the, the sessions. But just very quickly, today's panelists. Uh, Mr. Leo Smith, uh, Vice President, Marketing and Customer Experience at Fifth Third Bank, based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Mr. Paul Lesner, Leader, Market Solutions Analytics at Duke Energy, based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, Mr. Will, excuse me, Jill Waters, Innovation Resident at Adventist Health in uh, in California. So uh, welcome, welcome panelists. And then for myself, the next slide, please. Uh, I'm today's facilitator. And uh, this, um, this dialogue, this webinar, this, the, and the dialogue on the, rev on the webinar ties into uh, a, a recent work of my own uh, called Great Question, Generating Effective Questions for Successful Outcomes. And uh, as, as we'll get in with the panelists here shortly, um, this might seem like a very kind of basic type of treatment. That is, we could very well be writing a book, how might one ride a bicycle? Uh, you know, put one foot in the pedal and push. But uh, what, what I find and what we find at Spig is that posing the critical question, identifying the critical question, forming it, reaching a shared understanding with people that this, in fact, is the question where we to pursue it that might lead to authentic breakthroughs uh, is and can be challenging for, for organizations for any, met, any number of reasons, which we'll get into with the, with the panelists. And, and so that's really the focus of today's webinar is really what is, if we take a step back for a moment and, and we look at a culture of inquiry driving what ultimately becomes a culture of innovation, that, of, that is that ability to figure out the right questions and the right forms in which to pose those questions and the right ways in which to frame the questions, then, then how do we go about that and, and where are we today? So um, with that, if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna stop here with the material and then, and then move over to, to dialogue. So Leo, Paul, Jill, thank you very much for for joining us today on this critical question of the critical question. Um, I will say for the benefit of the audience that one reason why, why we're convening here is that each of you in your own way, you know, Leo with financial services, Fifth Third Bank, Paul 
in energy with uh, with Duke Energy, and then Jill, of course, in healthcare. Uh, each of those industries, those industries are going through dramatic transformation as we speak. Disruption driven by the digital age. You know, Leo, rethinking, re-envisioning what what does financial services, what does banking offer uh, going forward? Uh, Paul, of course, we have you know the introduction of renewables, the smart grid, uh, innovation at, even at the home with the with the smart thermostat that we've seen come online. And then Jill, of course, without, you know, there, there's no introduction needed really in terms of uh, reimagining, re-envisioning the patient experience, um, a lot of changes and innovation and exploration going on within the payor um, space. You know how how do we fund? How do we you know recognize value in, in the healthcare system? And and so in that context, um, I thought it might make sense for for each of you to to do a brief introduction and kind of reflect a little bit on just kind of the lay of the land that you're working in as you uh, as you pursue inquiry uh, and and help others pursue inquiry within your respective organization. So um, I guess to start, Leo um, as as our first panelist, perhaps if you could. Just kind of do a brief introduction and offer some perspective. That uh, that would be great. Yep. Hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Doug. Uh, my name is Leo Smith, as Fifth, as uh, Doug said, with Fifth Third Bank, and I've spent most of my career in in marketing. Recently, landing in customer experience, and uh, customer experience in at Fifth Third is is linked uh, at the hip with our uh, strategy folks. So um, we are uh, uh, you know driving. Um, where we're going as a company based on the voice of the customers and based on the voice of our employees as well. Um, so obviously the financial industry uh, has been very disrupted as Doug had, has mentioned. Um, you know, I, I, there were, it's unfortunate that some of the, the good banks, which we consider ourselves a good bank of 158 years, were painted with the same broad brush of the Wall Street banks that, you know, maybe weren't as ethical and um, cause the government to step in and uh, regulate a lot of what we do. And it was a massive change. It was, um, it was nothing that this industry had ever seen before. And we really needed to rally and come together to quickly come up with sometimes just a Band-Aid to pacify the Fed. But then how do we uh, sustain that? How do we uh, make it more effective? How do we make it more product productive? And how do we make it better for our customers? And um, we've done a great job with the tool in the last 18 months in, in doing just that and not just um, rallying around ideas because I don't think anybody's uh, short of ideas, but executing on those ideas, building the implementation plans, and then executing on them and then tweaking them as we go, all using the Spigot tool. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Paul, if, if you would share, uh, you know, provide an introduction and um, you know, share your perspective on you know, this, lead, this lead line of inquiry. Uh, thank you very much, Doug, and thank you for inviting me in today's webinar. Uh, in, uh, in Duke Energy, uh, I lead a group that's responsible for uh, analytical expertise. And so that notion of uh, you know analytics is um, is um, is closely related to this idea of inquiry, and uh, really at the heart of it, uh, the crowdsourcing platform is itself uh, an enabler of a culture where people think about the notion of inquiry. At Duke Energy, we've been uh, advancing this notion since about uh, late 2013, I believe, was the, the, the first embodiment of crowdsourcing at Duke Energy. And like many, it started as a rather small thing. In fact, I recall the first um, the first suggestion of crowdsourcing, or the the first time it was memorialized in a in a presentation, was back in 2011. So it took almost two years before we um, actually realized a crowdsourcing platform. And so uh, since then, I think we've run six, uh, six challenges. We're getting ready to run another challenge uh, in January, a large challenge. 
and you know, at each time, at each time we've decided to run a challenge, it's interesting that the question is almost always the first thing the core group struggles with. So long after there's been a decision to um, to run a challenge, and there's been discussion about what we'd like to accomplish by the challenge, uh, we run into the notion of well, how do we get to the right question? And as simple as it seems to form a question, it is in fact, um, like I say, the, f the first real challenge the group faces is getting everybody on board with the right question. And that's why today's discussion is really so important because it is perhaps the, the first struggle that a group that wants to run a challenge uh, has to encounter. And that's why it's, it's such an important subject today. Excellent. Thank you very much for that uh, that initial perspective. And we're certainly going to dig into the uh, the point you raised there. Um, Jill is our is our third panelist. Uh, perhaps a brief introduction and, and some perspective uh, on on this question of the critical question. All right. Hi, I'm Jill Waters from Adventist Health. I did a couple years at our corporate office working solely with an innovation. Uh, one of the major projects I did was relaunching the Spigot crowdsourcing software with a new focus on how we ask the critical question. And I found commonly our groups were happy to pitch all the different answers or all the different solutions or all the different questions that we should ask. And it was really interesting watching the different groups and their realization about how critical asking the right question is and how easy it is to lead your audience or your crowd to where you want them to go rather than to where their brains can offer the most unique insight into what you're trying to solve. So I have since moved on to our Central Valley Network, which is comprised of three of our hospitals, and we are doing some of the work here and running into the exact same fun challenges of how to ask the question and how to get groups engaged around the proper question or how to phrase it best. Excellent, excellent. And so, Jill, if, if we can carry on with this, uh, this line of inquiry for a little bit, um, and, and certainly for my part, not to leave the witness, of course, but do you think that there are certain aspects or characteristics of, of healthcare that make it particularly challenging for a group, uh, you know, however you would define or convene that group, to come at the, you know, the, the real go for the jugular question relative to, say, uh, the patient experience, uh, aspects of quality, uh, you know, even new, new product service delivery to the community. What, what is your perspective I, on that? I would say I don't know entirely how much healthcare is unique in this. However, healthcare has, oh, traditionally we operate around how do we make the doctor's job easier or how do we make the nurse's job easier? And right now we're seeing a paradigm switch, especially with all of the things that are happening in the government and requirements passed down to healthcare about really focusing on the patient. So the questions that we're pitching or are needing to pitch is focused around how do we provide the best experience and the best outcomes for the patient. And those are the kind of questions that we're exploring rather than the traditional kind of 80s thinking of, well, how do we make the nurse successful for her job? Um, so we're, we're utilizing a lot of the design thinking approach from Stanford and kind of the lean approach of operating around the customer or the consumer, in our case, the patient. So a lot of the questions are problems that we're approaching are revolving not only around asking the right question, but this paradigm switch of operating from a different perspective. I, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Doug? Oh, yes. That, that's quite good. And in fact, uh, you know, the reference to lean and design thinking is quite interesting because, of course, with those two, in those two disciplines, uh, the, the people who practice those disciplines know that you know that you should make time to basically you know, take a step back and figure out you know in the lean world what problem is worth solving 
And so I'm curious, uh, as, as your organization, as Adventist Health, has embraced these sorts of practices, um, you know, enabled by crowdsourcing, um, what has the response been with you with, in, the, in the group in terms of being willing, being able to take that step back and go, okay, what problem is worth solving here? I would say that in the last couple of years, Adventist Health has been able to embrace it much more. And, of course, we have pockets of success where the employees and different teams are readily happy to take on and really focus on kind of the root cause of where we're trying to go, um, and mm -hmm. especially with our CIS department, which is our clinical information systems department, they were happy to realize that what they were doing was creating more and more and more work for themselves. So they did some process innovation, and they used the software to innovate around what needs to be fixed in our software first, what, what is going to be the biggest bang for our buck within the software and then there's been other teams, uh, such as our Ukiah Hospital, that focuses on one aspect of care, such as the quiet at night scores that we get scored on, and patients and their, mm, if it's quiet at night, they feel like they got better care. But then realizing that it's not about the noise level, uh, through their crowdsourcing, they realize it's about the perception that they're going to get a good night's sleep, even though they'll be woken up at 5 o'clock in the morning for labs, and that's something that needs to happen for the best care. So we're seeing different pockets of realization. And then there's also some, some pockets of they're still accepting the fact that they might be fighting fires rather than identifying the biggest thing for their buck within innovation and crowdsourcing. You know, you know, if I could jump in for just one second and say that, you know, when we are, are coming up with ideas, we very much use lean, we use pick charting, we determine, you know, what, what's going to have the, the best bang for the, uh, for the effort, right? And I always tell people, well, we're not, we're not saving lives here, people. We're a bank, right? So in your case, Jill, you are saving lives. So your return on investment could be somebody's <laughs> life, right? So I find that very interesting. <laughs> So I'll, I'll give one more example. Um, at one of our hospitals, there was a lot of action around solving how do we staff nurses in an urgent scenario. When someone can't come in, how do we get nurses last minute? And they were doing a lot of work around simplifying the process of getting the nurse in, and they were looking to pitch a challenge around that. When they did a root cause analysis, they realized that the reason why they're having to do all this extra work is because they didn't have the physician vacation schedule. So by we actually didn't end up having to do some crowdsourcing because it was such a small group and they were so co-located. But really focusing on the root cause of why you're trying to solve something and asking questions around the root cause makes it so that whatever answer you have has a greater impact. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Paul uh, Paul Lesner from from Duke. Uh, you know, as you listen to Jill uh, relay her experiences, do you see parallels with um, the, uh, the utility sector and, and of course with, with your organization in particular, uh, Duke Energy, um, in terms of a you know the the evolution of a an organization of culture that was once somewhat inwardly focused to uh, an organization that's becoming increasingly outwardly focused, if you will, and, and implications of that are relative to figuring out, you know, what, what problems are worth solving you know, that, are, that are in front of us today. Uh, absolutely, Doug. The utility industry, especially the power generation electricity business, is going through a transformational period where, if you will, the original business model, one of a regulated utility with a reasonable expectation of return of investment, uh, mostly operating in monopolistic type territories, you know, that model is evolving uh, as we speak. And the evolution of that model has done exactly what you suggested. It has drawn our attention to the importance of an outward focus, especially a customer experience focus that previously um, I can say you know our focus was more internal uh, specifically related to operations operations efficiency and so forth and so on 
So for us, there's a whole new horizon of opportunity to crowdsource innovation, whereas previously it might have been in the nature of operational efficiency. Now it involves things like customer experience, uh, the customer's view of the service we provide, and so forth. And in in that area, you know, we're relatively uh, still exploring the the right avenues, uh, the right methods to to reach our customers in a way which they've grown to expect, mostly and largely driven by other organizations which have already developed uh, a really good ability to to reach the customer and satisfy the customer. So as I hear uh, Jill and Leo speak about their respective industries, I feel like we're following in their footsteps. Uh, the evolution has already taken place in many industries, and of course it's now uh, it's now upon us, but we're probably a little bit further behind uh, with respect to that evolution than, than, than Jill is in the healthcare industry and Leo is in the banking industry. Uh, very, very good, very, very well articulated. Um, and, and with that, then Leo, if I may turn to you for a moment. So, to Paul's point, you know, he's observing that perhaps financial services is a little bit further ahead of the game. The, the digital age, if you will, uh, hit information services and by extension financial services early, early on in the evolution of what we're seeing now or calling now as the, as the digital age. Um, and with that. Um, what, what has your experience been? What, what is your perspective on the uh, level of questioning that's going on within the bank? And, and by that I mean you, you know, in your role, you could look at very kind of granular, tactical, uh, kind of short-term challenges such as how might we improve the, the customer experience that we deliver at the branch level? Um, but at the same time, given the level of disruption going on in financial services, you could look at a rather, you know, big transformative question such as what does blockchain technology mean to, to this regional bank of ours? And, and so what I'm curious is when, when you're convening groups of people within the bank to pursue collaborative innovation, to apply crowdsourcing, um, do you get a sense that there's a, a desire or a tendency or a bias towards one level of transformation over the other? Um, are people willing to look for the very transformative or uh, is there preference to look at the very, you know, very much the here and now? What, what, what is your perspective? I honestly think to be successful today, you need to be focused on both areas. Um, you know, we, we, of course, through you know we we tap into the voice of the millennials right so we we have a big ship to turn so we need to be forward thinking we need to be yes focused on the we call it the bloody waters of today in, in this current competitive environment but we need to be focused on the blue ocean waters where we can enjoy you know clean blue water and ahead of our competitors so that is a simultaneous effort that we tap into the voice of the millennials and we happen to have you know, a, a large population of millennials here as employees. Uh, you know, we have 20,000 employees here, um, and they are also at customers. So we've we've recognized that, we've tapped into them, we've built portals um, to be able to solicit information on each of our products and services through the through the tool. And then obviously, the, you know, it bubbles up where any potential pain points might be. Um, to, to where we can we can rally around that and then quickly uh, adapt that into our our uh, strategic uh, mixing bowl and 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 kind of um, and determine where we're going to point our heading. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. You know, at, at Fifth Third, you know, our our tagline has been the Curious Bank. Um, so we have no shortage of. Of, uh, of inquiries from folks um, by any means. Uh, I, I think the challenge is, is taking the, the inquiry, uh, the idea uh, to uh, execution, right? Uh, successful execution and that's what really innovation is because um, I guess it drives me a little bit crazy when people talk, you know, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we, we're running an innovation challenge. Well, you're running an idea challenge and then the result will be the innovation. Um, 
I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, that's uh, that's quite good. And if I'm, you know, to follow on with that uh, line of thought, Leo, uh, I guess the other question that comes to mind, based on what you said, is as, as you go through this process with the various groups at Fifth Third, um, because what you're doing does involve something of a cultural shift from where the bank was even yesterday to where it is today. Um, have you noted either just kind of ad hoc or in some formal way, uh, you know, find yourself saying, well, you know, this person or these this particular group of people seem to be particularly adept at, you know, pursuing inquiry versus this other group which seems to be struggling? Uh, in other words, do you find some characteristics or attributes of, of one group or one person that and it makes them a little bit more open to and adept at um, developing those questions, building a culture of inquiry. Hello? Yes. Okay. I thought I lost you there. I, you cut off at the end. So, uh, should I re yes. Please, I, I, you cut off at the end. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Leo, I was asking, you know, as you are pursuing your uh, practice of collaborative innovation there at the bank, um, are you finding that there are particular people or even groups of people that are particularly adept at posing the critical question, pursuing the, crit the critical question, you know, driving to outcomes? And, and if so, what, you know, what might account for that? We are. So, um you know, we, we've rolled this out across the enterprise. I've, I've had my arms around this initiative for about a year, and, and I, I guess it had kind of been in place for about a year prior. And what I did is I kind of aligned with people within uh, my customer experience organization that uh, were, were line of business focused executives and, and had them champion, uh, you know, find a line of business champion to, to kind of drive ideation around what was important to them. And, and some of those areas, so, so yes, uh, there, are, there are certain individuals that are absolutely excellent at formulating the right questions with, with my help and with, with your help. Um, and, then, and then also um, doing something with the ideas that they get. So in particular, uh, um, our, our complaints space, right? So it's funny that you know, most companies have an office of the president, right? So um, you know, and I, uh, an issue gets escalated up to the office of the president, it gets attention, it gets resolved, uh, and that's about it, right? We've recognized that complaints are gold, right? So we want to hear from our customers that they've taken the time to complain to us. We want to, A, resolve it. We want to, B, uh, learn from it, which is the deep dive uh, through questioning through the tool. Um, and then we want to rally around uh, mitigate, you know, uh, resolution first, immediate resolution, and then um, mitigating it from ever happening again. And, and I think each of those steps is is uh, we use the tool um, to run challenges to different communities based on where what they're good at, right? And and we've learned that through experience and through time. And we've also learned that um, you know both of the panelists have mentioned how critical a question is. You know, I, I, as being an old-time marketing person, I can get any outcome that I want. I can, I can lead the witness, as you had said, uh, and, and get the outcome that I want through a survey, but that's not really the best use of the people's time, and it's a waste of our time. So having those very pointed questions um, has been critical to our success um, and, and, and critical to the engagement that we've um, enjoyed here at Fifth Third. Oh, very good, very good. And Paul, kind of following on to what Leo was saying, uh, what has your experience been at Duke in terms of, you know, as, as you've worked with various groups in, in that organization, have you found, you know, Leo was saying, for example, that folks that already were in the business of problem solving, by their very nature, are, are good at this, at figuring out, you know, what, what is the true nature of the problem? How do we look at the problem? How do we resolve the problem ultimately? Um, have you had a similar experience at Duke in terms of finding, say, fertile ground for collaborative innovation, people who just naturally are curious and, and uh, want to figure out what the right problem is, how to phrase, phrase that, how to frame that, and, and then go forward from there? Yes, Doug, I think uh, our experience has been similar, but um, 
just like the evolution of the markets and the, the business models, I think we're probably a, a little bit further behind than, uh, for example, Leo's description of Fifth Third Bank, where they are, how they've progressed in the maturity curve. I think, like many organizations, we have many pockets of innovative thinking, people who are posing the questions, critical questions to themselves in small groups. And they seem to exist almost like in cells. Uh, they, they attract people who are, um, you know, motivated to solve problems. But scaling that up to a to an organizational model is, in fact, um, harder than most people think. I, I think of it as like um, a little bit like a driver's license exam. Most people can get all the questions right. Uh, they can certainly recognize good questions when uh, when there are other sort of bad, they can understand the good answers when they're posed with the uh, you know bad answers next to it. So they can they can pick the right answer, but that doesn't make them a good driver. It just makes them you know good at taking driver's license exams. And I think the question is uh, forming the the right critical question is also a little bit like that. In, in other words, it looks easy, but it's not. And although we have some pockets of uh, of business units inside of Duke that have more experience than the enterprise as a whole, um, it, it still takes time to develop the practice of getting the question right, forming the question. Um, the nuances of the words and the choice of words and the length of the question are all critically important. And uh, it's, you know, just to speak of a, another, you know, sort of metaphor, it, it's, it's a little bit like surfing, and that is it, it looks easy from the beach where everything is stable and dry. But in fact, it's really, really quite, quite difficult once you, you get in the water and you decide you want to do this. And, and that's my experience year after year, and my experience recently on forming a question for a, for a big, almost nearly enterprise-wide challenge that we're going to run next month is you know everyone has an idea of the critical question and what they're trying to achieve but coalescing you know everyone's individual notion of the right question around the single right question is much more of 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 an art and part of the practice than most people believe i think most people believe getting the question right is easy and that you can arrive at the question quickly and I think that, in fact, is um, not the reality. The reality is it's much more difficult than most people expect. It's much more than just a pedestrian activity. I would like to echo that sentiment because, you know, having somewhat of an ego at, you know, being in marketing my entire life, and not that I'm an egomaniac, but I thought that I was good at writing questions until I met Doug. Um, you know, I literally – rolled this thing out across the enterprise, as I mentioned, and I had a line, uh, line of business champions. But when it came to the, uh, the, the activity around building questions, Doug came with a, a, a blueprint of how to build an effective question and, and a mapping um, uh, of how to map an, a question. And it was arrows and lines and stick figures. And I kind of uh, got a look from a bunch of my peers from across the room. Um, and I got to tell you, my, my predecessor, who, who had been running the tool for a year, um, about jumped up and said, hallelujah, I wish I had known that a year ago. So I can tell you that um, it, it opened a lot of eyes in the room, and we spend 75% of our time, when building a challenge, focused on the question. Doug, can I add? Interesting. Yes, of course. Jill, please. So at Adventist Health, we found almost the exact same things that uh, the other the other leaders are voicing. We found that one of the biggest keys to success is like three different people coming around the question or three different disciplines coming around the question. The, the one is leadership, executives, VPs, and even down to the director level because they know what the core issue is that they really want to solve. So having them there to voice what it needs to be solved was critical. And then having someone that does process excellence or somewhere in the process world, they really bring the, the understanding of the need to plan the question and understanding how much time it really takes 
to identify who's in your value stream, who who needs to be involved in this. And so, therefore, how do we phrase it within words that they understand rather than using the top-level jargon 